all journeys start somewhere, and mine was here, in an antiquarian bookshop. You never know what you might find in these places, a first edition of British Pacific Locomotives by Cecil J. Allen, or maybe an old Bradshaw timetable. Now let's see. Among Papuan headhunters, history of the French in India, Tiger Slayer by order, the Lunatic Express, from the Cape to Cairo, by E. S. Grogan. I wonder if you took the train. Good morning. I'm interested in the Cape to Cairo book which you have in the window. Could I please have a look? Yes, of course you can. Thank you. That's the one? That's the one. Thank you very much. This book describes the very first south to north crossing of the African continent. But Grogan took very few trains. Mostly he walked or sailed in river steamers when he made his journey way back in 1899. I'm quite interested. How much is it? Marching through Africa 100 years ago was real adventure. All man-eating lions and cannibals, I expect. But what's it like today? Grogan has given me an idea. I'm giving myself five weeks to travel as far as I can from Cape Town. With a bit of luck, I might get as far as Nairobi. But whereas Grogan travelled on foot, I'm taking the train. Grogan's march through the dark continent was the ultimate ripping yarn. After being sent down from Cambridge for locking a goat in a Don study, Grogan mounted his expedition to win the hand of his sweetheart. His supplies included champagne, the complete works of Shakespeare, a phonograph, plenty of Worcester sauce, and of course a Union Jack. But Grogan was by no means the first white man in Africa. The first European settlement at the Cape was established in 1652 by the Dutch East India Company. By the beginning of the 19th century, the white descendants of the early settlers, the Boers, had clashed with local tribes and wanted independence from the British government which then controlled the Cape Colony. The result was the Great Trek, a giant migration of farmers looking for a new homeland in the interior. The foundation stone of modern South Africa was being laid. As the great powers carved up Africa at the end of the 19th century, one man had a vision of a railway from Cape to Cairo, Cecil Rhodes. This promotional film from 1934 sums up the jingoistic mood of the times. <laughs> our description of this great railway project by presenting to you Cape Town, the capital city of South Africa and the starting point of the railway. Here we have a bird's eye view of the city, nestling in the shadow of the famous Table Mountain. This is Adderley Street, the main thoroughfare of the city. Saturday morning in the flower market, which is always a very busy time. Five miles out of Cape Town, in magnificent surroundings, is Grutus Kia, formerly the residence of Cecil Rhodes. It was here that his great dream of empire, a railway from Cape to Cairo, had its birth. A tremendous project. Half a century has gone by since Rhodes conceived his colossal scheme. Let us now review the progress made to join south and north by rail. Northward was his cry. To Rhodes, it all looked so simple, a railway to conquer Africa and paint the map with the red of the British Empire. 
Modern Cape Town is the end result of such imperialist adventures. Generations of white rule have transformed the fabric of society in southern Africa. In today's Adderley Street, the trams and the flower market have gone, replaced by modern buildings, clean and businesslike. Just outside of Cape Town, you can still see some of the original Dutch settlements. This is Stellenbosch, a 300-year-old preserved town. Everything is painted white here and squeaky clean. Even the oak trees are national monuments. This is Sharon Wright, my travelling companion. Before setting off, we're tasting the famous wines of Stellenbosch. Mmm, Delheim um, Spatzendreck Late Harvest. Very, very nice, actually. We are, um, as you can see, living it rather rough and tough in, um, in the gentle sophistication of South Africa, but I can assure you it's going to get worse. Cheers. Although the rails go as far as Nairobi, you still can't buy a through ticket. But at least we're traveling first class. Mm, and let's see, platform 24. Here she is, the Trans Karoo. Apart from the luxury blue train, this is the only regular service to Johannesburg, 25 hours away. Unlike the blue train, the Trans Karoo is a train for ordinary South Africans, irrespective of colour. Although apartheid is being dismantled, a sign like this can be misinterpreted. Rhodes' dream of a railway through Africa was shattered by politics. Now Sharon and I have a political problem. To get to Nairobi, we have to pass through Tanzania. And we've heard that Tanzanian immigration may refuse entry if they suspect we've been in South Africa. Although we both have two passports, there is a risk that border crossing stamps might give the game away. We can't be sure of the best place to swap over passports. Anyhow, we've got three weeks to solve the problem. For now, we're off on the first leg of the journey, bound for Nairobi, we hope. Our first port of call is the R, halfway down the line to Johannesburg. How was this line built? The colonial invader tamed the native to build his railway, as this excruciating commentary confirms. In the early stages of construction, the native labourer, always very willing and teachable, played a great part. There were certainly plenty of him, his wages were not excessive, and he didn't belong to any union. But he worked hard from morn till night, and the line gradually assumed shape and form. These native gangs are easy to handle. They respond splendidly to training and soon become expert hands in the arduous work of rail construction. You can see how efficiently they pull together and how thoroughly and wholeheartedly they help progress. Here, the laying of the sleepers is quickly and efficiently done. These heavy rails take a lot of handling too, but the strong and wiry natives take little heed of the heavy material Here are gangs completing the sand bedding of the line. What a combination, if they could only sing like the vulgar boatmen as they work. After 130 miles, we start a stiff climb up the river valley, reaching an altitude of 3,000 feet. There is a wealth of picturesque scenery visible as we wind round the hills and down into the valley on our way to world-renowned Diamond Field.
Today, attitudes have changed, but the views are just as spectacular as the train climbs the river valley and then enters the vast semi-arid scrub known as the Karoo. Sharon and I are not the only ones to appreciate the splendor of crossing South Africa by train. Mrs. Anna Duplessis frequently uses the Trans Karoo and even joins the occasional special train. The highlight for me was coming across the mountains from Oudsweden to George. It's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful passes. Oh, come on top of the mountain, you look down, there's down the sea way beyond the mountain. It's really beautiful. And on top of the mountain, they, the train stopped. There was no platform or anything. We just jumped off, you know, yeah, onto, onto the rough stones and things. And some people came up from below previously, and they were waiting for the train there. And they got onto the train and did the journey down, just, you know, to experience that winding trail down there. It was lovely. Oh, I really enjoyed it. And now, Jordan says, Mom, you are, you, you're quite mad. You, you're going to sit on that train for five days. It wasn't so bad. It was only two and a half. So it was all right. The funny thing about this place is that it seems to be completely deserted. We arrived quite late last night off the Trans Karoo at about half past ten, and we were both given uh, very small rooms, very basic in fact, rather like prison cells, but they were very, very clean. And uh, it's now Sunday morning, and uh, I'm in this quite large uh, washroom here in the DR uh, railway hostel, but there's absolutely nobody about. I suppose it must be off season. The only sign of life seems to be at the town fountain. Redundant steam locomotives near the station lie derelict and rust away in a silent graveyard. Steam has vanished here, or has it? This is why we stopped in DR, to catch a ride on one of the last authentic steam hauled freight trains in South Africa. This magnificent locomotive has been named after an old London and North Western engine by her regular driver, John Gilberthorpe. John is a Yorkshireman who came to South Africa 20 years ago after steam finished in Britain. That's the thing about steam. Once it gets into your blood, you're hooked for life. John's fireman is Richard Niven, a Glaswegian who also moved to South Africa to keep the steam tradition alive. As if to help Richard feed it home, Enchantress was built by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow in 1954. But a few years ago she was destined for scrap, so John and Richard devoted themselves to keep an Enchantress in working order. They replaced pipes and gauges, cleaned her up, and made it worthwhile for the authorities to keep her running officially. They even paid for her brass identity plates to be replaced. With abundant coal reserves, it made sense for South Africa to hold on to its steam locomotives, but not for much longer. Within two years, regular steam is to be phased out in favour of diesels and electrics, which are cleaner and less labour-intensive. But today, we are going to wallow in pure nostalgia.
We're off to Kimberley, 235 kilometers away. They call this line the Steel Kyalami, after the Grand Prix racing circuit near Johannesburg. It's a fitting name for South Africa's last steam main line. on the footplate of a class 25 NC locomotive. Uh, we are about uh, 30 minutes out of the R station. We're coasting along at something approaching about 75 kilometers an hour. It's very noisy up here. There's a lot of coal dust flying around, but it's great fun. Four hours after we set off, night has fallen and Kimberley approaches. The massive grate of a Class 25 NC is fired by a mechanical stoker, but it takes skill to finish the run with the fire as perfectly smooth as this. With Journey's End in sight, it's time to clean up. It's a far cry from the blue train. When the driving is done, the office work starts. For Richard, the fire needs raking, and there are some giant lumps of clinker to shift. Only a few months after this film was shot, Enchantress breathed her last. Without knowing it, we had witnessed her final hurrah.
This is the MAF King Mixed, the daily passenger and goods train to the Botswana border. Once we crossed into Zimbabwe, a surprise lay in store. This is no recreation on a preserved line. This morning, as on every morning, the Botswana Mail is hauled by an articulated Garrett locomotive. This one is number 424, a 15th class built by a Bia Peacock in Manchester 40 years ago. Number 424, we later found out, is jinxed. She jumped the rails twice near Bulawayo and in an effort to break the curse, she's been renumbered. Grogan took a stagecoach from Maf King to Bulawayo when he came this way as a trooper in 1896. That journey took nine days compared to our one. Bulawayo is situated in what was once the Matabili Kingdom, presided over by King Lobengula. The trouble for Lobengula was that Matabili land was rich in minerals, minerals the white man wanted. A clash was inevitable. Lobengula fielded 18,000 warriors against 1,000 mounted troops. The trouble was, the white man had five Maxim guns. The Matabili were crushed, and all in the name of civilization. This appalling episode in colonial history was mitigated to a small degree when, after more fighting, Rhodes himself intervened and promised an end to white aggression. With fighting at an end, the railway was finally extended to Bulawayo, and everyone was friends again. The first train steamed into Bulawayo on the 4th of November, 1897. This archive film was shot about 30 years later. This is Bulawayo, now a prosperous township, situated 1,360 miles from Cape Town, with a white population of about 9,000. Bulawayo is an important landmark in the Cape de Cairo line and one of its busiest centres. One hundred years after Lobengula was crushed, the Africans have reclaimed Bulawayo, although the colonial past will be hard to shake off. Today, downtown Bulawayo reminds me of Haywards Heath. You have to go into the markets to find a more African flavour. There is one part of Bulawayo which will, I suspect, never give up its colonial traditions. This is the Bulawayo Club, a fading outpost of empire, where everything is, well, British.
Members enjoy reciprocal rights with the Carlton in London and the Athenaeum in Melbourne. The gentlemen who come here are the few who stayed on after independence in 1980. The Times arrives from London five days late. The main subjects for discussion are the test match scores and the vintage of the port. Just occasionally, someone might refer to the country as Rhodesia, a slip of the tongue you can get away with here. There's peace and quiet all right. Hardly anyone bothers to visit the library. Yet right here, in the very heart of Africa, you could while away the hours with a complete and bound set of punch. The walls are covered with the portraits of big game hunters and contemporaries of Rhodes and Grogan. They stare out disapprovingly at the new Rhodesia. The only thing left is the smell of leather and polish and the ghosts of the empire builders. Their dreams died with them. A few miles outside of Bulawayo, in the Matopos Hills, Cecil Rhodes is buried. Sharon and I are visiting friends in Bulawayo. It's also time to tackle that knotty problem of passport stamps. Yesterday we went to the immigration office in Bulawayo to try to sort out this problem of passport stamps. Um, we are both travelling with two passports, one which has South African stamps in and a clean passport. The problem is that we really wanted to appear to arrive in Tanzania with a passport stamp which said Zimbabwe rather than the border crossing, because a border crossing stamp is likely to arouse some suspicion. Well, we were quite lucky. They gave us uh, a stamp which, in fact, says um, the validity of our visitor's entry has been extended. Um, it's not perfect. It doesn't actually say border between Botswana and Zimbabwe, but it does actually give us, I think, a very good chance of getting into Tanzania without any problems of being questioned about our uh, passage through the southern part of the continent. For the first time in two weeks, a chance to relax. Before leaving Bulawayo, we have an appointment. Israel Nhari, locomotive inspector of the National Railways of Zimbabwe, has given us permission to film Bulawayo's vast collection of Garrett locomotives. Ninety of these monsters are allocated to the shed, one of the last places on earth where you can see so much steam in one go. Ya 
Kulelise, ezeni la wantu. Kulelise, 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 ezeni la wantu. Kulelise, 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 kulelise. Time to move on, and we're taking the Zambezi Express. So tell me, do you uh, prefer to work on steam engines or diesel engines? I prefer to work on diesel engines. Uh, the cleaner and uh, in, our in our country, uh, the weather is a bit hot. So I prefer diesel for cooler atmosphere and uh, cleaner, a cleaner job. Uh, but uh, in winter, uh, I prefer to work steam because it's warmer on a steam engine.